and tell Jafar and he said, Hello Jafar, what are you doing here in Baghdad? And Jafar said, Well, I've come looking for a master who could guide me on this path. And the green one told Jafar that, Well, there are two things that are wrong in your search. One is the place. You must go back to Spain because your master is in Spain, not in the east. So Jafar thanked him and started his journey back to Spain. Ah, incidentally, he even gave the name of the master who would be guiding him. And he said, in Andalusia, you will come across a man whose name is Mohidin Ibn Arabi, who belongs to the tri uh, tribe of Tai, And he is the greatest sheikh of this age. He must be the Kutub of that time, maybe. So you approach him and he will do the need for you. Jafar came back to his own native place and started making inquiries about this Mohidin Ibn no, Arabi. No, two things. Ah, that, uh, the other point will be clarified by no, Mohidin. He has not, the green one has not said that. No, he did not say that. He only told him two things are wrong. Which are the two things? Yeah. What is the other one? Which is the other one? You didn't What's mention. The other, one? other one will be clarified by the master later ah, on. No, no, no. <coughs> so, that is the way yeah. uh, Mohidin reminds him of what he did. So Jafar came back to his native place and uh, made inquiries as to who is this Mohidin Ibn Arabi and he was told that well he is attending such and such a school and Jafar approached that school thinking that the very least that would be there that he must be the teacher of that school. Sure. So when the school dispersed he approached people and he said uh, could you point out to me Mohidin Ibn Arabi who belongs to the tribe of Thai? And the students pointed out to him a young boy aged about seven years old. And Jafar was totally surprised. Anyway, since the green one had hinted at it, he approached him and he said, Are you Mohidin Ibn Arabi? And he said, Yes. Then he said, Are you the only Mohidin Ibn Arabi in Andalusia? And the young child said that, Yes, to the best of my knowledge, I am the only one from the tribe of Thai. Then Jafar asked him, are you the greatest sheikh of this age? And the young child said, Well, Jafar, I require time to answer this question. And Jafar very brusquely told him that, Well, in that case, I have no need of you. And he left him and began his search again. Thirty years later, Mohidin ibn Arabi now established himself as the Kutub of that time and was holding his own court. And Jafar, after a lot of wanderings and disappointments, came and entered that place. And Mohidin ibn Arabi saw him entering the room and shouted and said, Well, Jafar, you still don't have any need for me. And Jafar could not answer anything. He bowed, uh, you know, hung his head in shame. Then Mohidin ibn Arabi reminded him of that meeting with the green man. And he said, Jafar, do you remember the green man you met in the marketplace in Baghdad? And he said, Yes, I remember. Do you also remember that he said there were two things that were wrong in your search? He said yes. He, re he recollected that meeting. And now Mohidin uh, clarified what were the two things. And he said, the first thing was that you were looking for me in the wrong place. I was all the time in the west when you started looking for me in the east. And the other thing was the time. Thirty years had to elapse before you could be really ready to surrender at my feet. Now sit down, Jaffa. Jaffa. <laughs> Hmm. That's great. Anything more? New? Something new? When a wayfarer enters this path, one of the qualities that are required is uh, this quality of all being the all-knowing one. I'm not talking about the avatar or the perfect masters. Even wayfarers, it seems, acquire this quality. So in a certain city, a wazir of the caliph was told that a Sufi has come there and so he approached him to pay his respects. And after all the meeting was over, the Sufi gave him a watermelon as a prasad. And this wazir took it to home with him, very pleased. And he cut up the watermelon and to his great surprise, the watermelon was rotten. So the wazir felt that there might be something bogus about this people. And he reported this incident to the Caliph and he said, Well, they declare themselves to be all-knowing. Here I go all out of my way to pay respects to this man. And he offers me a rotten watermelon. 
If he was all knowing, didn't he know that the watermelon is rotten? And the caliph uh, felt that the logic was right. So he says, Yes, call that man, we'll find out what it's all about. <coughs> the Sufi was called to the court of the caliph, and the caliph said, Well, this is a thing that has happened, and uh, you Sufis always declare that you are all knowing. So didn't you know that uh, this watermelon was rotten? And the wazir said that if you cannot uh, prove this quality of being all-knowing one, then you will have to pay the punishment for this uh, blasphemy. And the Sufi said that, yes, there is this thing called all-knowingness in us, but if you want to really know it, you will have to follow me for a while before you can acquire this uh, quality. So the wazir, uh, the caliph said, yes. <coughs> What this man says is correct. If you want to find the answer to it, well, you will have to do his bidding. And the bidding was that this wazir should now follow the Sufi for a month or so. And the wazir agreed to that and the Sufi put him on some certain disciplines and training. And after the month was over, he brought him back to the king and he said, well, I am ready to perform my demonstration if the court so wishes. And the king said, yes. And the wazir uh, took them to a certain place where uh, it was uh, the normal process, people would be passing by from that place, you know. It was sort of a place where people got together on the way from the, wherever they wanted to go. It was the sort of a downtown section. Mm -hmm. And they reached there, the caliph, the wazir, the court, and the sufi was there. And uh, this was that intersection where three or four roads met. <coughs> And the Sufi put his hand on the shoulder of the wazir and he said, Now keep watching the people who come and go. And suddenly this wazir started shivering <coughs> and was in great fright. And within an hour's time, his tone had turned absolutely, his hair had turned totally white through that shock. Mm. And the Sufi asked him, Well, wazir, what is wrong? How come all this fear and your hair has turned white? And and he said, my God, the external appearance of someone was so ferocious and this and that, and yet he was a good man. And there was someone who looked so nice and all, and he is absolutely rotten within and this and that. That, 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 that ability or that capability to find out the truth dawned on him. Mm -hmm. And he, this frightened him. And then when he removed his hand, the capability was no more. And then the Sufi turned to the Caliph and he said, Yes, we are all knowing, but it is not necessary that we should use this capability to find out whether the watermelon is rotten or not. Only as and when required, we use it. That is the story. It's really a time when we uh, see each other, talk to each other. Think of the times we were in the Bible, or jokes that we have told us, or things that have happened. <clears throat> Otherwise, each one is so busy in their own thing, you don't see much of each other to tell, exchange information, or talk of topic or something. And um, sometimes we get on the subject of jokes, jokes that we have told about and about and enjoy. <laughs> And one that I thought of just now was uh, about this uh, Red Indian. The Red Indians are supposed to have very good memories. Not to have some Red Indian bubbles. Uh, they don't forget things, you know, they have really good memories. So this, this, just, this story was about this big American magnate, cigar smoking, driving Mercedes Benz, he goes in there and suddenly sees um, a red Indian, very interested in him. He goes and talks to him and looks at the specimen. He asks certain things and then he, he says, what do you have for breakfast, eh? What is it you have for breakfast, eh? And uh, the red Indian said, scrambled eggs. And then the magnet said to go away. So, off, he's gone in a cloud of dust. Some years later, he happens to come again, and he sees his old friend, the Red Indian. And by now, he knows how you greet a Red Indian. 
So he goes up to him and says, How? I'm sorry. The joke was, What do you have for breakfast? Oh. Eggs. Eggs. So years later, when he comes and says, How? The man says, Scrambled. <laughs> 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 and I re really laughed at that. <laughs> one, one joke, uh, the, it was not Mullah Nasruddin then, but now I see it in the shape of a Mullah Nasruddin story. There was this man who laid himself flat on the railway lines, determined to commit suicide, that the train go over him. Everybody's on the platform. Everybody's very concerned, uh, desperately trying to save the man, but they couldn't get down to haul him up because the train is coming. It's coming very close. So everybody says something. He says, give, give me your hand. Give me your hand so I can pull, pull him out. In the meantime, Mullah Nasruddin is there. He parks through the crowd. He says, what is it? He says, a man, he walked out. The, the train's just coming, he'll be killed. And no matter how much we tell him, give me your hand, he won't. We can't. So Mullah Nas Nasrud then goes over, squats on the platform, near him, bends over and says, Hey, my man, what's your vocation? The man says, I'm an income tax collector. He says, Take my hand. Immediately, hand comes out, he pulls him. Pulls him to safety. The others are surprised. So how did he do it? He said, never tell an income tax inspector to eat. <laughs> Use the word take. take. <laughs> 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 so there were two Koshits among us. She was the older and this Koshit, which we know is younger now. So we, for young and old, we, literal translation is big and small. That's why you often find somebody saying, my small brother, he really means my young brother. Or my big sister means my older sister. So she was big koshed, and the koshed that's in number nine, but the small koshed. Now she has become big. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so big koshed, at that time was in the ashram with us, and uh, wholly devoted, wholly surrendered to Baba, really very hard working person too. And uh, she said, Baba, I have only one wish. I, when I die, I must die at your feet. My, my death should be at your feet. Nowhere else, at your feet. So Baba would say, Baba said, and she repeated it. Fine, Baba said, do it now, do it now. <laughs> you see, the, at that time, it seemed light and we all, you know, there was laughter and fun, as is now, when I'm, I'm saying this. But we realized long afterwards that because she would not be with Baba in physical form at the time of her death. So anyway, Baba made her do it. So it was a mock death. She had to go down on her knees and pretend there she was flat dead. She must move. And then we all, you know, had a good laugh and uh, that was that. But even symbolically, even in that way, See how uh, committed he is to our longings, and our longings concern him. He does not fail. He never fails. But to look at the precise detail, the tiniest insignificant thing that he even observed, she had asked this. And so, although it would not be at that time, uh, Baba made it happen then. It is as good as that when she died, it was at Baba's feet. There's one other it's a little instance, just a small instance to give you just an idea, to give myself also an idea, to have an idea, because these things, as we go through them, we would realize, we would become aware. Now, like when Baba was at Arnavas and Nariman's place. Now, I'm only giving you the essence of it. The detail may not be completely, it could only come from Agnava's herself. But this is what I uh, gathered of the essence of the story, which is important. Is that when last Baba was in their home in Bombay, and as Baba was leaving, 
The Baba would not be visiting Nashiana again, but of course nobody knew it. This was in Baba's plan, knowing that as he was he embraced Nariman, and Nariman, with all love, said, Come back. It's in a pachaljo. Always to give it a come back. And Baba was leaving, but he stopped, suddenly stopped, absolutely still. And then he took two steps backward and came again forward, embraced him, and then left. Mm -hmm. This was, he had come back. He had gone, come back, embraced, because he knew it would not be. But even this, in this way, symbolically, as I say, or in this little action, Baba fulfilled every promise, every longing is a promise. And as he once said, because once when something had happened, and just like we were saying now, we were laughing, and you know, so the Baba says it, but it's not done, it doesn't happen, because he means it in another way. He turned around and very seriously looked at me, because I was tittering more than the others, and said, remember, I'm the only one who fulfills all promises. I'm the only one who never breaks a promise. Oh, speak. <laughs> and Papa said, there, then it is. But little things like that, or even, even sometimes unasked. Uh, you know, Baba would come down from the women's side in the morning to be in the hall on the slip chair. Hmm? And the Monday. The and whenever the clock struck, <coughs> whatever Baba was saying, he would turn and say, see, what I've said is true. The clock chimed. And that's what I'm doing now. Uh, Baba would come over from the women's quarters in the morning to the mandali hall on the lift chair, lifted by the mandali or the garden boys. And as he comes past that uh, oval, of the flowers and, and, and the garden. And and this little cottage that is here has a table on which I used to sit and do my typing and family letters. Now it was time for Papa to come over. So just as he was outside on the veranda and then the door would be closed so that Mara and we all would be in, then the men could come approach <coughs> Papa and bring them over. So I'd come over to my little office there. There I found a woman from a hut, a villager from a nearby thing. Uh, a very simple person and uh, poor, a villager. And she said, oh, she, she embraced me. She said, I, I want to see Baba. I want to see Baba. I, I have a longing. I, 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 I rushed here. I had to come here. I must have a glimpse of him. I said, but I'm sorry. I said, but Baba's in seclusion. This was the very last year. I'm sorry, you can't see him. He's in seclusion. And, yeah. you know, I can't even ask him. Oh, but but I felt in my heart something was pounding. I could see something in her face that just you know, overwhelmed me. So I said, I'll tell you what. You stand beside me here. The lift chair goes by. Baba goes on, on that chair. They lift him and carry him over to this. So there was just this much portion which is open so that for a few feet where Baba's going by, you could see. But it was winter time. Baba not only had <coughs> his scarf around, but because of the cold wind, he was holding a scarf, not only on his nose, but he had a scarf all over him. You know, he just took his scarf. Instead of time, he just put it all, all over, like, like, like uh, covering himself. So I said to myself, doesn't matter. As long as she, she can see, she can say, she can say, so Baba, it's Baba, isn't it? So, I said, now wait, hold it here. And we both stood there, and the chair, but I, I make this motion, but as the man lifted it, it swung, you know, up and down, and I looked like that. There was Baba coming. And as he went, I saw, because I could see, I saw the face was covered. Just for that little distance, Baba, without turning his head, without looking at us, still looking straight, just coming here. When it came to that portion where the woman could see, Baba lifted the cover. 
When that was over, he took the cover down. He uncovered his face just for that portion of the path where, which was visible to the woman. Well, when that was over, he covered his face again. Her longing was fulfilled. All she wanted. She came for nothing. She came to ask for nothing, to wish for nothing, to have a glimpse. That I had a glimpse. And she came. She, we don't usually see her at that time. And she came come all the way from the hut because since that morning, all she wanted was that. Couldn't she have it? I said, I'm sorry, and I was sure she couldn't. How about you? That purity and intensity of that longing reaches him always. And he responds directly and so perfectly. I, as a witness, was amazed. I was, I was watching this. And I thought I was going to be part in it, telling the woman I'd, I'd you know, help her. But not, I had nothing to do with it. And other things like this. That's again is the time when Baba was coming that side on the big chair. And there again saying, see, I had come over earlier to get some papers from my desk. And I saw that they were bringing Baba across. I was standing here. And as Baba went by, it's a, it's a speedy uh, passage, you know. I mean, they quickly um, hurry. They hurry to carry him on that big chair over here. It's not a dawdling, naturally. So, the Baba had his scarf held to his nose so that the cold draft wouldn't go. And he was being carried. And then, that little low hedge around that oval of the garden, which you pass by as you come in, as Baba was going by that pretty fast, and, and this kerchief on his nose, he just gave, turned his head just like that, gave a glance at the hedge and the little scarf is a nice flower to nobody in general. Nice flower. This, this gesture for flower was fingers here maybe because you smell it. Nice flower. Very fast like that. Crutchet this uh, scarf on his nose again and they all passed out of my side with Baba. And I was crutching my head. Flower. There is no flower. What's it? Which flower? I couldn't believe it. So I went, I went near and I gave a glance all over the hedge. No flower. But distinctly, Baba said, nice flower. I couldn't believe it. I was being quite crazy about that. So then I, I bent over close to the hedge, you know, inspecting, like you would be inspecting the pattern in a, in a carpet that you know is there, but you can't find it. There I found one low little flower, the first one that had blossomed. Now this was buds, green, but this little flower hadn't even come right up, but it had close to the hair, a tiny flower. And Baba was seeing that on his way past all the whole flower bed around the hedge. And he had seen, he had not missed that little flower that had put up his head for him. That made me think that if Baba does not neglect a tiny flower like that, could he, could he possibly neglect the things of our lives, the things that uh, uh, matter to us, the big things, the things concerning his lovers, when he, when he could not uh, neglect or bypass a tiny flower? How lacking we are in trust that we could even think that. No, never. He takes care of his own. He, he never fails us. I, I, I think a number of times of, uh, at the time when Baba was talking about the Dasha he was going to give uh, in 1969 in Guru Prasad in the summer and we, we could see how the health was, couldn't possibly imagine how Baba could physically endure such a, an odd ordeal because of his body. Physically it would be an ordeal. The rest is, of course, he's giving his love, and that's 
and we were concerned. And power, uh, let's told us, we would express our concern. I would express my concern, and Baba would say, very easy, very easy. Baba, how can, how can it be possible? We were concerned because we wanted in time to send out a circular. Now, Baba wasn't telling us to do it, but we wanted that it should be saying, it's postponed, it can't be. And Baba looked at me and said, so easy, so easy. I'm, I said, uh, the next time when I saw Eric, I said, Eric, I'm going mad. I keep reminding Baba, and he says, it is easy. So the next time he tells him in front of me, he says, he says, pointing to me, my sister, she's mad. <laughs> I keep telling her it's so easy, and she keeps, you know, talking about it. But then, when Eric expressed his concern, also when he said, Baba, it's quite all right. Your lovers will know. They love you. They wouldn't want you to uh, strain your your person, your body, and this and that. And he looked up at Eric and said, Eric, I won't let you down. That sentence, once again, he, he never let us down. We are not to worry about that. What we are to worry about is that we never let him down. He just hold on to me. Baba has said everything. Baba gave us many, many hints that he would drop his body. But we didn't recognize them. We didn't translate them right. Our minds didn't translate them right. Because Baba would give it with one hand and then cover it up with the next. But those things were stored. So when it happened, all these things came out. Ah, oh, yeah. He had told us. Oh, but how stupid. He had, didn't, hadn't he said this? Oh, my goodness. This. And then. And the most perfect, because everything that he has planned ever, even in the worldly sense, as not only God but as man, has always been perfect. And to us, the most perfect touch was calling for this message on the last day in the room where he dropped his form. Mer Azar, Azar means freedom. And in Mer Azar, he freed himself from his man's hand. And he called for this message. And of course we didn't know one of the things. He said, Alava should bring it over next day. And when Alava brought it into Baba's room, bedroom, and you know, naturally, Baba couldn't be disturbed. Baba is not well. And so it was left there. So it has stayed there. And later when Mara said, but Baba hasn't told us anything. Hasn't given us <coughs> the message. I said, it's there. He has given us this message. But as usual, in a silent way. So this was the last message Baba gave to <coughs> Is this the very Whatever board? Whatever I do, <coughs> the board is the. It's for the highest benefit. It's always, even that, even that act of grace, of dropping the form, is for us. Even taking the dog is for us. Giving the app is for us. Now being with us is for us. I tell you, this is the most fortunate time. Actually, in the Indian tradition, uh, man form, because they understand the Hindus, the Hindus have such a profound and, and, and deep knowledge of, uh, you can call it religion, call it what you like, but of evolution and incarnation as the goal of life and that eventually it is to reach God, all that they have. And uh, they realize the importance of a man form, a human form. <coughs> At least in their, in their belief, in the overall <coughs> acceptance of the fact. So whenever there is kirtan, which is a, a, a beautiful form of uh, spiritual entertainment, you might call it. So especially it happens in the villages. There is no television or uh, films 
as a rule, but uh, down through the ages, is these kirtan karis that go from village to village and they sing of the saints and their lives, of the great lovers of God. Uh, they sing in verse and then they stop and then they expand in prose. And then again the bhajan starts. It's very entertaining. We get it over the radio every Sunday evening. It's called kirtan. And as we remembered hearing the kirtan kari, there used to be one very good kirtan kari that Baba used to call uh, when he was in Narabad. Who would do kirtan before Baba and all gathered, the whole village. And they always would begin this, uh, the blessing of this human body. Not there. Uh, how blessed we are that to be in this man form. So that in itself is such a tremendous blessing because it has been a long journey. And it is in this man form that you get to recognize him, to love him, to realize him. And on this earth, how blessed is this earth on which we are now? But the Baba said, there are many universes and the whole thing, but it's the earth from which you receive that. You can, you can achieve that only from this earth. So, not only are we on this earth, not only are we blessed to have the human form, maybe at the end of a chain of human forms, but at this time, in the avataric orbit, to be linked with him, to be so fortunate as to be selected by him to give the prasad of his love, to touch your heart, to say, hey, I'm it. And you pass it on. It's not for the world. It's not declared. It's not announced uh, that. But it's like like um, a little secret that passes from shoulder, and then he taps you on the on the arm and says, "I'm in disguise, but this is me." And at this time, just the few that we are, who are blessed to love him, to know him. I think this calls for celebration. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I also love, love that story when Baba himself uh, had uh, referred to it I don't know in what context this was brought up but at the time when uh, you see when uh, Jesus Christ with Baba as, as Jesus and uh, the disciples would hear of, uh, of the disciples of John the Baptist yeah who were in sackcloth and... And uh, while the bridegroom eating, is with eating us. Eating desert fruits. Yeah, yeah while the bridegroom... Yeah. When the bridegroom is with and us, they, there's they, no they need for fasting. Said, we like rejoice. Like she said to Baba, look Baba, there uh, these ashrams that they do these meditations and chanting and they ask us, they, and it's true, when they would visit us, they ask us, I suppose you meditate all along, huh? Uh, all day long, or do you do this? So what do you do in the ashram? And you couldn't say what you were doing. You, uh, you just did whatever Baba told you. But, you know, it didn't. So in the same way, they must have gone to Jesus and said, you know, the others say that you, you're, you're, you're wearing good clothes and you're just being so normal. Like, uh, And then Jesus said that when the bridegroom comes, appears, it's a time of rejoicing, joyous. And you see, that's why Baba tells us, be happy, but don't mistake it for be merry. No. Be happy means no matter what situation you are in, no matter what particular thing you have, may have to go through at the time, no matter when there is shadow, no matter when there is sun, to be happy. Not, not just to be merry, but you know, to be happy for him. For that. Uh, so we used to say, oh, thank God we have Baba. You know, supposing we had some master who made us do fasts or had to read so many chapters every day and then, you know, know this or do that. <laughs> you know, Baba's is inside. I, I must say that, in a way, <clears throat> it's much easier. It's something you know about and you do. Baba's ways is not easy. He never has promised that it will be easy. But he expects 
He expects that we will please him throughout, however difficult things are, or always see, uh, be sensitive to his pleasure. Would he like me to do this? Am I doing this? Would that please him? You will always know. Uh, because no matter how much you justify to yourself that yes, yes, it means that, but you always know. And, and uh, to please Baba is the greatest thing. You may want something, but if you know what Baba wants, and you do that, and you please Him, that's about anything you can do for Baba. And that's why my most favorite quote of Baba saying is about loving, and said, if, if you love me, as St. Francis loved Jesus, you would not only realize me, makes a place, but you would please me. That's greater. For a lover, it, the thing is to please the beloved. Is above the only goal, above all goals. Because that is for him. Seeking, even wanting, even wishing anything less is for yourself. But to giving, pleasing is giving. And sometimes I find, no matter which way you look at, it's Bhagavan who's doing all the giving. Even when he allows us to feel we are giving, it is because he has given. He has given us the wish to do it. He has given us the grace to want to do it. Or even to try, as he tells us, try, try. Even even now, sometimes in fun, even, as, oh my God, when I see so many children about screaming and jumping, and I love children, you know, I love children. But as I say, I love other people's children. You know? yeah. I know they'll go home at night and <laughs> she'll <laughs> love peace again. And I tell myself, and Baba said, they would tell us sometimes, look what you've given up for me. You've given up your youth and your life and your this and your that. Sometimes Baba would, you know. That would, when, when he was not telling us what junk or broken down furniture we were, and he didn't know why on earth he gathered us around him, you know, he can't understand it, you know. But when he would say things like that, and I realized even that wasn't so. Even that which he said we gave, gave up for him was his giving to us, because I couldn't imagine him being it. <laughs> so when we see all the other side of it, we said we. Baba saved us from all that. Because I don't mean it's like that for everyone, but you know, you know what I mean. That, but I'm trying to say that even when he uh, makes you feel you have given, even at that time you have received, you have not given. Tell them about your dream, about the clo uh, clothes line. How many times have I told that thing? They don't know. I have not heard it. Do you not know? If Christine hasn't heard it, yeah. I can tell her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this dream I had when I was a little girl, when I was home, Little than Christina too? Mm -hmm. <laughs> younger than Christina? Oh yes. Although Krim is very young, I was still younger. Mm. <coughs> I was home, you see. I hadn't joined Baba for good, which was just before my 14th birthday. So I was only 10. I dreamt that uh, I was sitting on the edge of a big cloud up in the sky a beautiful white cloud and I was sitting on the edge of it with my legs over the edge and I had a very lovely white dress the dress I had for my Holy Communion, no joke it was lace and and, and, and very full and very lovely Really? Yes, so I had that on and I was seated and I was seated before this enormous being a man formed with nothing on, but he was a being. 
All I can describe him as a tremendous being, this man before me, who I knew was God. I knew I was seated before God. He was huge, and I was little, and I was at the edge of the cloud. And I was straightening my dress and hoping he noticed it. My thin <laughs> dress. I looked at him, and he didn't say anything. And he just took And then as I sat before him, I looked over the cloud, edge of the cloud, down below. And just a little distance below, I saw there was a clothesline up in space, a clothesline, and there were little clothes with, with, with clothes pegs on, little clothes with them, you know, nappies, tiny baby things were all lined up there with the clothes pegs on it. And I looked at it, and I knew there's nobody lived here except him, God, so it must be his clothes. But he was so big, so huge, and these little baby clothes. So I kept looking at the baby clothes, and then this thought came in my mind. He said, oh. And I looked at him, and my thought was, Oh my, they must be a very tight fit for babies. And he looked at me, and he thought, Yeah, very tight fit. And I woke up. And, and I, I told about it this morning. Me, Shaka, and God. So you see, when God comes in man form, that's how tight it is for him. That is why when once somebody said, Oh, manifest, Baba, manifest, uh, reveal yourself, Baba. You must reveal yourself to the world. Reveal. A very emotional person. And Baba said, I agree. It's very easy for me to reveal myself, you see. There's no problem. The problem is not revealing myself. That's very easy. The problem is to hold myself in. Till the right time. And then he gave a delightful illustration. He said, like, if you have wind in the stomach, no problem releasing it, is there? The problem is holding it in to the right time and the right place. So simple, so clear is the life of that. I'm sure you saw my dress. <laughs> but you know, it's extraordinary. You did not feel him naked, though he had nothing on, he was just an enormous man form. You did not think or feel as naked, just being. I mean, he looked bigger than even the form I saw, and being. And I knew he was God. And all he did was answer my thought and said, yes, very tight. <laughs> Bonnie, when Baba drops his body, his physical gross sufferings come to an end. But mental and emotional sufferings, do they continue until whatever time? Or is that the end of all suffering as the avatar has to bear the suffering of humanity? I know that it could be the end of the physical suffering. One day... That's what I mean by the things that Baba has given the, the the pointers to this coming event, which we couldn't see at the time. But it was one day, not, not near the last days, but not very long ago. Baba wasn't, <coughs> he, he looked up at me, and I'll never forget the expression of his eyes. And he said, how long should I suffer? And I looked into his eyes. Couldn't say anything. And later, I realized what he meant to us to make it easier for us. It's some way, in some measure, that 
a clear about his physical suffering, this is suffering is over. So that we should not mind as much as we did. It lessened the agony when we were part of that. Sure. Because God having a form is suffering, is in itself suffering. And that's, that's for us. So, about the rest, I don't know. I, all I know is that Papa said that after my birthday, I'll be strong. I'll be so strong. And that we are experiencing. But also that he kept mentioning 14 years. 14 years. And uh, even in Pune, after that great seclusion work, when he said, my work is completed, fools that we were, we didn't realize that the form itself is work. That's the tool for his work. And that when the work is over means the form is over. That he would drop, he would discard the coat. The work is over. But, uh, so at that time he said, he said, I, what, what do you think? I'm here 14 years, 14 years. Meaning, in this form. And, uh, well, you know, Baba said, yes, Baba, yes, Baba. We couldn't, one can't, we can't take it. But whatever Baba says, fine, at that moment. And then he makes you very occupied with other things. So that's Stop. all right, that's Baba's business, not our business. Then later, in 1969, January, when my brother Adi, Jr., and his wife and family, Shireen, and all were here, it was Dara on this occasion, Mary's birthday and all. And they were to leave on the, I think they left on the 10th of January, 1969. And uh, Baba was still coming over to, uh, to the Mandali Hall, even at that time. So Baba said, uh, huh, what happened was, uh, it must have been beginning of January, 4th, 5th, maybe. Adi Jr. had a cold. So, Baba was more in his room then. So he would call the men monthly there, but he would also come here. I think he came here till the 14th. 13th. So, 13th, yeah. So this was before that. And uh, Baba told him to stay in his room till the cold as well, not to come to his room and visit him for a couple of days till it's cold. That's well. Agree. So in the morning, Baba says, go, go tell Adi. Go ask him, did he sleep well? How is his cold? Now before that, I must tell you that after seeing Baba on this visit, Adi felt sure Baba would drop his body. He came and told me one. He said, can't you see? Can't you see? I said, see what? He said, Baba won't retain this form long. I said, how, how can you say such a thing, Adi? He must be crazy. And his wife, my sister, also the same thing. So that, that is the background of it. Anyway, he is in his room. He's not visiting Baba for a couple of days. In the morning, Baba sends me over, says, go tell, ask Adi, how is he? How is this? the cold? Is he all right? Did he sleep? So I go. The second day when I go to Adi and say, Baba again ask, how are you? He says, my cold is alright, now I'll be able to come in a couple of days. I'll be able to come tomorrow. Uh, did you sleep? No. Why not? Well, if I tell you, you'll get angry on me again. I don't want any of that. I said, you, you still, you're still hopping on that? Ah, you must be crazy. So, I go over to Baba. Baba said, what did he say? I said, Baba, he said he's alright now, his cold is much better, he'll be able to come tomorrow. Did he sleep? No, Baba, he didn't sleep. Not till, till after one o'clock. He just couldn't sleep till morning. Why? Now, what am I to say? So, I said, uh, he was worrying about your health, Baba. He's mad. Crazy, said Baba. Call him. Huh? Yes. So I go over, I said, Baba was. I'm there in the room with him. Baba said, how's your home? Oh, but much better, Baba, from tomorrow I'll be able to. You didn't sleep, huh? You didn't sleep. No. Why not? 
And I said to myself, what's he going to say now? Mm -hmm. And he, without knowing it, repeated exactly what I had said to Baba. He said, I was worried about your health, Baba. Ah, said Baba, you crazy. Did you not drop my phone? I'll be here another 14 years. Again, that number 14. Now you see, what I'm saying is what we <coughs> interpreted from the gestures. But we often, there are different interpretations to the same gesture. We don't know what Baba meant. But we do know the number 14. Was it 14 years? It was, in fact. That's, you see, when he said 14, days. naturally I interpreted it as 14 years. We don't know. But 14 came to very clear. 14 years. The same way when Baba had said when he was in Manzila Mim, according to notes I found after Baba dropped his body, there will be 14 with me at the last. So I thought maybe he meant after Manzila Mim was disbanded <laughs> and Baba came with the others to Marabad that there were 14. No, it didn't work out at all anyway. And I said to myself, hey, let's see. How many were with him? Resident monthly means those who had no homes of their own, who just lived with Baba, you know, right at Mehrazad, with a day and night. How many were there? And something made me count. It was 14. I believe eight men and six women. So, this number 14 has Topic, uh, that's, that's what I find out when I read, but Baba himself, for that, uh, in, um, in the beginning of January of 1969, he made emphatically some reference to 14. So then, we made a lightning call to Adi and the senior was here and I asked him to say Baba had dropped his form and he came. But when Freni heard it, then she realized that somehow I didn't know. We didn't. Even, even with that, we couldn't see it. And then we looked back, oh yes, Baba had made it so clear. Remember he said this and he had done that and he... You see, when Baba would tell us to do something, he would make, he would say this as from me, like that uh, illustration I gave the other day when Baba would have Eric sent telegram, signed Mayor Baba, without even wanting to read it. And yet the message would be exactly what the receiver needed or expected or wanted. In the same way, when Baba told us to make a circular for the darshan in Pune and Guru Prasad, he just said, do it. And even we didn't realize, Erich and I was helping him, we didn't realize uh, the significance of some of the statements we put in. Do not ask Baba for blessings anymore. His blessings are with his lovers always, huh? things like that. Mm -hmm. what, what made us put it? But when Baba said, when I say do it, it's from me, and we realized that even in that Baba had made it clear. But, as I said, with one hand, you would feel, and the other, you would cover. But then later it all became very clear, very evident. And other things which were just witnessing. Here is uh, the Stukaram saying, and from that saying that in 1968, the last December, last week, last part, anyway, at the latest part of that year, Baba was sitting here, and after pointing at some of his saying or something, <coughs> he would refer to Tukaram's saints, and he, 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 he would most Often refer to this saying of Tukaram, Tuka Mane Ugitraha Jeje Hoirati Tipa. Tuka says, Be still, you know, just relax and, and view, watch, see whatever happens. It's like, you know, all this that will pass by, by you, 
just just uh, see it, see it. And that's what we have been doing ever since Baba dropped his body. We have just we just see all that he is projecting, all that uh, work that he had done, which he had told us about, like the film that he had already taken, as it were. And now on the screen of his world, we just we see it, and we are going to see much more. What we don't know, we just witnesses. It's nice. Nice knowing we haven't done anything to make this happen. It's that's, that's called having your inside view, huh? <laughs> ah. It's 1.30, money. Okay. Lunchtime. But you see, I'm never hungry, Eric. <laughs> I like fasts and I like good. meditation. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 You won't believe it, but I used to like silence days. I still do. Don't like fasts. <laughs> Not much, but enough to have enough time. Very simple. There's a uh, one who had written the article, the little news information reporter. He had mentioned there that well, it was uh, with a great feeling of uh, relaxation that uh, Einstein, what was his name? Albert, Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was with his grandchildren at the seashore enjoying the sunset or sunrise, whatever it was. And uh, it was a feeling of great joy for those who were around to see him enjoy and be relaxed like that. So the children can do anything. Means nobody could get him out of his office for such a little thing, you know. But only the children could have done it. And that was a good thing for Einstein and People around them were admiring, Einstein admiring sunset and sunrise and being with the children, enjoying the sight. Well, that, was, that was read out. Baba liked it. Mm. Baba was very happy that Einstein at least mm. took little time away from his headaches, you see, and enjoyed the sight. But he didn't remain quiet there. Then he began to tell us things which pertains, is mm -hmm. pertinent to you, what you have said just now. So he said to, he just put a question, you see, interrogated and asked us things. He says, how must it be with Einstein? The one who, you may call it, the propounder of the theory of relativity. The one who is knowledgeable, man of, man of letters, you may call it, one who is supposed to be very wise, how, how did he take this particular effect of sunrise and sunset? He, said he enjoyed it. He enjoyed it, he said. But he says, does he not know that sun never rises and sun never sets? But he gets into it, isn't he? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And allows the children to have the delight of it. He knows that sun never rises and sun never sets. But he enjoyed the sunset, he enjoyed sunrise, and so forth. It was a greater delight to the children, and at the same time, he derived delight out of the delight of the children. So likewise, I also, and I know, there is nothing in creation besides myself. I am always there, I don't come and go, I am... I'm like the sun. I'm always there, more than the sun. I'm ever eternal. You see. Time and again, when you find me in your mysteries, it's just like the earth coming and approaching the sun, and you see the sunrise, and you see the sunset because it is the sun's rising and sun setting. You see, not the sun. Yeah, it is the earth rising and earth setting. You see. Likewise, my eye being there in your midst all the time, it's you who come and approach me, you set and all that sort of So then he posed a question. Yeah. Yeah. So then he posed a question. This, this morning we were talking about it. And he says, well, 
after this was done, he says, how many people in the world <coughs> take delight in sunrise and sunset? What is the percentage? So he said, well, good. people are so preoccupied, you see, only poets and uh, artists, you see, they, they take interest in that, but not always. Sometimes there's a flare-up, you see, and poets describe the beauty of sunrise or sunset and the clouds and this and that. And, but says, but out of all that is there on this earth, all the living things on the earth, how many, what is the percentage that take notice of sunset, even notice, let alone what you call uh, taking delight mm -hmm. in it, yeah. yeah. Noticing sunset, sunrise, how many? Very, very meager number. Can't talk in terms even of percentage. Say at the most one percent. Yeah, that's how the world is. <clears throat> and especially at midday sun, they take it for granted. They, some, at least, there is some vestige of little interest, you see, at sunset and sunrise. But at midday, when the sun is high above, nobody would care to look at the sun, you see. You can't look at it. But they take it for granted. When it is at its height of benevolence, shedding its rays of life and some sustenance and nourishment and everything, then... Uh, hmm? is taken for granted. Likewise, I, who am in your midst, sunrise and sunset, when I am in your midst, when I come in your midst, hardly one, hardly, you may call it, there is no percentage that takes cognizance of my being in your midst. Just rare beings, you see, rare persons. You know. Yeah, the beautiful sunrise. Likewise, sunset. Yeah. It's more, it's very glorious, sunset. So that's only few. Although the existence of all living creatures on this earth exclusively depends upon sunrise, sunset, and the sun itself. And yet, how many do care for it? Same thing with me. And knowing that, but still, he is in our midst, he is shed, sheds his grace on us all equally, without any discrimination or anything of the sort. So to approach him is not possible. Allow him to approach us. You can't go and reach the sun or anything of the sort. You can't. Let sun sh shed its rays on you. That's why he's, he comes to us. You can't approach the sun, so he comes to us. He, he, he takes birth in human form. He becomes man for our sake and comes to us. Because we, as human beings, cannot go to him. Like the sun. <laughs> Having any definite views and ideas to approach him and to please him. This morning I was saying, somebody, I forget now, no amount of our striving or anything of the sort would ever help us to please him or anything. We have, we have done our best to do anything of that sort. Yeah, to please him. We have never pleased him. <coughs> he is so unapproachable. He is so independent, verging total, totally on big talents. You cannot, cannot be pleased with anything that we do. Hmm? So, the only thing that is left for human beings is to strive or level best not to displease him. Hmm. That, is, that tantamounts to 